to those who just joined, welcome. Uh, so this interview will be recorded and shared with uh, our network. Uh, as I said before, the Bridge Career Services is a department of Bridge to Rwanda. Uh, Bridge to Rwanda is an organization that uh, works with recent high school graduates to uh, push them through a gap year program uh, and preps them on uh, different skills and later uh, takes them through different applications uh, to try and get them to have uh, admission for colleges. Uh, so the bridge was created, sort of come full circle and find uh, uh, these students who go abroad uh, jobs back home. Uh, but we don't only do that for the for Bridge to Rwanda, we do it for a couple of people that work with the UNL, the Shora Girls, uh, the Rwanda Presidential Scholars, and uh, different people in the diaspora, uh, mainly looking for opportunities back home, jobs and internships. Uh, so yeah, we could we could we could kickstart this. Uh, for those of you who will be watching later, uh, our guest today is Diane Saidi, uh, currently the program manager at Mastercard Foundation. Uh, she's also a co-founder of a fintech company called U Plus Mutual Partners, and a multimedia company called Legacy Forty Five Entertainment. Uh, she's also an entrepreneurship coach with her big sis. Big system in, in business initiative. Uh, yes, so good evening, Diane. Good evening, Alvin. Thank you so much for having me. I'm a big fan of uh, Bridge to Rwanda, always have been. Um, so, yeah, this is a full circle moment for me, too. Um, I remember when Bridge to Rwanda was just starting. Um, so glad to be here and to, to speak with you and uh, all the young people. Thanks, thanks for joining us today. Uh, actually, Say that Bridge One actually just made the scholars program in particular made 10 years this this month. So congratulations. Yeah. yeah. And all the impact you've made. You guys should be very proud of yourselves. We we, we pat ourselves on the back from time to time. Kudos, kudos, Kabis. Mm. Uh thank you. So just um uh, introducing yourself, could you just give a, a brief background uh, career-wise, uh, where you started and uh the journey to where you're at now, um, what you're doing at MasterCard Foundation, and then uh, how you also started or co-founded the different, the fintech company and multimedia media company that, that, you, that you own. Okay, so how much time do we have? Because <laughs> it's been a long journey. Uh, <laughs> it's been yeah. a long journey. Um, what time? Okay, so where it all started, I think, you know, sometimes we don't even realize where it started until we look back, you know. Um, so thinking back, I think it started with my very, very first job that I can remember where I actually got paid. Um, and that was when I just moved to Rwanda in 1997. And I, my aunt had a video store. Remember when we used to rent videos like Blockbuster? It was not Blockbuster, but something similar, the similar concept. Uh, and she would pay me equivalent of a dollar a day. One dollar a day. And it was my first attempt at sales. You know, she needed, she need, cause she's like, guys go watch the movies first for us. It was myself and my, my family friend. Uh, it was two of us and she said, go watch the movies and then give reviews, give reviews so that you can, you know, tell people, oh, this is really good. This is really funny. This is dramatic. This is sad, etc." And that was like, you know, teaching me how to pitch, you know? Um, yeah. I did it with myself and um, another another young woman at the time. Uh, her name is Lillian. I, you know, you might know her as a singer, Lillian and the Sundowners. And she was just starting her. She wasn't even just starting her career in singing. She was an aspiring singer, and she would sing to to nobody. She would just sing to people to get them into the store, and that was the way she would pull them in. Uh, and that was a marketing tactic. And now, you know, of course, she's a, a fantastic singer and sings with Lillian and the Sundowners in Uganda and across the region. Um, so that was really my first attempt. But of course, I was in, I think, singer two at the time. Um, so it was something I did on, you know, the weekends or the long holidays, um, just to keep busy. Um, and also to be able to watch those movies for free, right? <laughs> Something had to be in it for me for more than a dollar, you know? Uh, so yeah, so that's what I did. And then after high school, 
I ended up working at the radio, Radio Rwanda, and I and I read English news. I broadcasted English news um, to to the wider population, um, and then I went to study. I went to do my undergrad in Toronto, and I studied uh, public administration and governance, which is, I would say, the practical version of political science. Uh, and then moved home and worked for the Rwanda Development Board. When I was at the development board, I, I was placed in the investment uh, promotions department, and that got me really interested in business. And that was not my background. My, you know, my background was political science, basically. And I thought maybe I would do a master's in public policy, or maybe I would go do, um, like, go to law school or something like that. But RDB got me really interested in business, and I wanted to be on the opposite side. I was like, I wonder what it's like to be the investor. Um, so I ended up doing a master's in doing an MBA in international business, specializing in international business. And while I was doing it, um, you know, when you have to do the thesis uh, towards the end of the year, and I said, I don't want to do a thesis. You know, this is a business school. I want to do a. I want to have a business plan and graduate with with a business idea that I can go and that I can go and implement. Mm -hmm. So you know, academics, you have to work in and around the system, right? So I did do a thesis, but I did it in a way that it could turn into a business plan. And that was really the, 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 the spark of uh, U+, what became U+, Mutual Partners. And the thesis was called The Next Big Thing. And I think it was like mobile money, the next big thing or something like that. Um, but it was at the time, it was about international remittances and being able to send money back and forth, especially on the continent. Um, you know, in Rwanda, we have a lot of students in Uganda and Kenya, et cetera. How do we, you know, pay for school fees or give them um, pocket money through mobile money at the time? Um, you know, can we do MTN Rwanda to, M to Safaricom Kenya? At the time we couldn't. Um, so that's what the thesis, the thesis was on. And the idea just kept developing. Um, when I moved back to Rwanda, I decided to invest in a sector that a lot of foreigners uh, did not invest in, and that was media. Because when I was at the at the board, at the Rwanda Development Board, we had, I think, nine priority sectors at the time, you know, like mining, agriculture, tourism, etc. And media was one of them, and nobody ever wanted to invest in media. Uh, because of the role that it had played in the genocide uh, for various reasons. So they just always backed away from it, right? So I said, no, but there, you know, we have positive stories that we can tell, young people can lead. So I started Legacy 45 Entertainment. And it was easier for me to start because I could control that as opposed to starting the FinTech, which needed partnerships with the, with the MNOs, right? With the telecoms. Um, so I started it and I did Rise and Shine Rwanda, which was a local uh, morning show on, on television. Uh, the first morning well, show. I, think I remember. I remember that. With Arnold yeah. Kinder on them. Yes, exactly. With a lot of young people. I think there were five, uh, five or the five people, the original, the original crew. Um, and so we did that for almost four years. I think we did it on, on TV for two years and then online for two years. That had a lot of financial struggles because um, doing television is expensive right? The production crew, the cost, all of it is, is very expensive. And the business model behind it is advertising, right? That's where you get your revenue from. This is a very small market to advertise. Um, it's the big dogs that give you advertising money, right? The telecoms, the banks, the insurance companies. But how many of those do we have? Um, so it was very hard. So we got a lot of development money, uh, donor money, and then the donors would say, okay, what are you going to do once we leave? Because, you know, donor money is always for a limited time. Mm. So one of them uh, told me at the time, they're like, why don't you think of Kickstarter? Why don't you look into Kickstarter and see if you can put the show on Kickstarter? When, and then, you know, because we had a, a huge diaspora following. So I said, okay, I'll look into Kickstarter. So I did, looked into Kickstarter, looked into uh, uh, GoFundMe. None of them really worked for our context right? GoFundMe felt like causes, like, you know, when you fundraise for somebody who's sick. Mm. Uh, Kickstarter was more up our alley or Indiegogo at the time, but, you know, they didn't have mobile money. We were talking about, you know, even young people here who wanted to support, they couldn't. So it was very exclusive. It felt exclusive. And it just took me back to, to my thesis uh, when I was doing my master's. And I said, you know what, 
if if I could do a financial platform that could do everything, it could you know the way we yes sending money to students uh, the remittances, but also um, these different projects for young people in business. Um, we save together. We you know um, we have community efforts where we bring money together, literally put it in a box, lock it, and then um, you know people come back and and open it. And it, but it's very traditional, very you have to be in person. It's not digitalized at all. So I said, can I combine all of that? And you know the the point behind it, the main point behind it is you know collective wealth, right? That's the only way we're going to move forward as a continent is collectively. Yeah. So collective wealth for different reasons, whether it's for savings, for investments, um, for family benefit, whatever it is, but collectively. So that's how U Plus came about. Uh, it was really a reminder of what I was trying to do when I was at my, when I was doing my masters, and helped me contextualize it uh, for this market and for the time. Um, so yeah, so that's that's a brief. Um, okay, so the whole journey. So after you, when Rise and Shine stopped and U Plus was still trying to, you know, find its its legs, um, I got I, I ended up working for a company called Kasha, and it's an e-commerce platform for women. And short story on that is I was pitching at Seedstar. I don't know if you know Seedstar. Um, it's like an incubator online competition. Yeah. Well, in person and. Joanna, who is the CEO of Kasha and founder of Kasha, was also pitching at Seedstar. And I was pitching U+. And I loved her pitch so much that I told her, oh my God, I wish I had money. I would invest in your company. I, I love it. I love your pitch. I get it. I, it's, I get it 100%. And, you know, and then a year later, U+, was still struggling. Um, and I needed a job, you know, so you have to pay the bills. So I needed a job and she was she was looking to hire somebody, a country director, and I went through the, the process and I got the job and I was with Kasha for two years. Um, so yeah, so Joanna is one of my mentors now and uh, remains a close friend and Kasha is dear to my heart. And um, so Kasha is still very much a part of all the many things that I do uh, to some degree. And then I left Kasha going to the MasterCard Foundation, which is where I am now. The MasterCard Foundation has been in Rwanda for, I think, three years, about three years. I joined two years ago, and it took me back to my tourism days. So when I was at the Rwanda Development Board in investments, I was in charge of investments in tourism, in the tourism sector specifically. So when this position uh, opened up, I said, oh, I have a lot of experience in that area. Um, you know, maybe I can help out and, you know, learn more about um the, the, the development uh, NGOs, because uh, I didn't have that experience. I had government experience and I had private sector experience, but I didn't have uh, NGO experience or international NGOs. So it's something I wanted to learn. Um, yeah, and then also they just were expanding so quickly. Rwanda was the first country and now they're in seven countries in two years. Um, so I just thought in, in terms of growth, growth, um, it would have a lot of opportunities. Um, so yeah, I, I manage a program called Hanga Azaza, which means create the future. The foundation is all about young people and youth in work, uh, employment opportunities, uh, entrepreneurship opportunities, and Hanga Azaza is specifically focused on tourism for young people. Um, so yeah, so that's what I do. That's what I manage. And we currently have 12 partners across the board and in terms of training, so different levels of education from TVET to math to, to degree programs and then short programs uh, like 10 months and a few weeks. And then also demand, so access to finance for entrepreneurs, um, business development skills, and then people who are looking for jobs. Uh, we work with an organization called Harambe that helps uh, with job placements and getting ready for job, uh, getting ready for work, uh, et cetera. So that's that program has been three years. It's about three years old, uh, and the foundation is looking to expand into other sectors. Uh, but for right now, we're still we're still in uh, just tourism and hospitality. That's where I am. <laughs> that's, that's quite the journey. <laughs> Actually, my next question is going to be uh, what challenges that you faced. But I guess you've mentioned uh, most of them. So it would be uh, what do you enjoy most about what you do? in these different fields. Yeah, in the different fields. I mean, I think I really enjoy new beginnings, you know, just starting from scratch, having an idea and seeing it through. 
and seeing it grow. And I, you know, when I was thinking about it, I think it's like gardening. Do you garden? <laughs> you know, plowing the land and it's just soil and it's dirty and it is like not motivational. And then you start adding seeds and water and then, you know, little by little it grows. It really is magical. You know, it's magical to see the difference in just, you know, a season. Um, I think with entrepreneurship, you have to know that seasons might take longer than a few months or than anticipated, right? Um, but it's still, the journey is worth it because to, to get an idea in your head and then to see it out there and to see it impacting people. I know people who have told me they have moved home because they used to watch Rise and Shine and they were like, oh my God, so-and-so is doing this and they're doing that. Oh, what can I do? And how can I contribute? And oh, I don't right. want to leave me. And you know, I don't want it to leave me behind. I want to be a part of the growth. That's Rise and Shine. Um, you, you know, Kasha, the, the whole premises behind Kasha was um, to really to give women power, right? Um, whether it was around pads and not having to buy them in a secretive manner because, you know, or the HIV self kit, uh, who wants to go to a pharmacy and say, oh, I want an HIV self kit, um, but also contraceptions, um, you know, so just putting really the power in women's hands, like take over, take control of your health, right? Um, yeah. And then expanding that to their families and just putting different products, um, you know, for babies, for, for their husbands, for their sons on the product and really making it a family value based business uh, was really interesting to me. And I think um, e-commerce at the time was very new. Uh, it, it had, you know, the thinking of e-commerce has expanded and, and had adapted because of COVID because we were forced, <laughs> we were forced to learn how it works. But at the time, I was like, oh, e-commerce, different. That's, that's new in Rwanda. And, you know, to be, to be a pioneer in that sense uh, is always exciting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it sounds like, like you have a lot uh, on your plate. Uh, how do you make sure everything is uh, running smoothly? And most of all, how do you balance uh, work and life? Yeah, I get that question a lot. <laughs> I think, I think uh, for me, I'm, I'm super organized, you know, I'm super organized. It's, it's a gift. It's one of my gifts that I have. Um, I'm, well, actually, I don't know if I'm organized. I'm a planner, right? So I will know I have to do this, I have to do that. And I live by the calendar, the calendar, whether it's Google Calendar, Outlook, phone, whatever. I have multiple calendars and they all have, you know, there's this that's booked. And after this, I have a workout because I need energy to, to do other things from 7 to 10 or 11 p.m., you know. So how do I stay on calendar? Just be organized. Um, I know people who have like color coded systems and stuff. For me, all of that is not really. I just need a calendar and I need a reminder. I need a calendar and a reminder. And when you put in <clears throat> things like, I don't know, a meeting at a lunch meeting at Java at yeah. 12, right? 12 p.m., 12 to 1. And then you're going to say, I have another meeting from 1 to 2, but it's online. Unless you want to be driving with the, somebody, you know, with a headphone in your ear to be able to make that meeting, you have to think of the logistics. I think people, a lot of people forget about the logistics. Oh, I'm in Java and I need to go to the office or home. I need to go downstairs and pay. I need to get out of the parking. I need to drive. It's going to take me 20 minutes. So maybe the meeting should be at 1.30, right? The other one ended up one. This one ends at 1.30. So I think a lot of people don't think of how much time it takes to actually do things and to go from one meeting to another, right? Um, so all of that is in my calendar, driving from Serena to Kigali Heights, um, you know, logging in to, to make sure that this functions properly at 5 p.m. We needed to meet at 4.50. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. all of that um, to be really detail oriented um, is, is, is really important. Um, and then in terms of balance, I try to give myself a day off for family and friends. So sometime on the weekend, uh, if I can get a full day, that would be great. So maybe usually Sundays, uh, if not, then half of Saturday, half of Sunday, um, Friday, after, Friday afternoons. Yeah, I would say Friday afternoons or like Friday, at like 3, 4 p.m. No, no Zoom meetings, first of all. I have Zoom fatigue by Friday. <laughs> so no Zoom meetings. Yeah, okay, I'll put yeah. you on the Friday. No, 
I would have been like, sorry, can we do it on Monday? So no Zoom meetings. And then I just tried to relax, you know, whether it's Netflix or pizza and wine or whatever, just try to, to tone down. And then I have to say I have long days. So, and sometimes I'm good at this, sometimes I'm not, but I, when I, when I am good at it, I think it helps a lot is the working out, work out for one hour, you know, then get ready for another 20 minutes or so, you know, shower change. I have to input that into my day. Otherwise my days are really long and I'm just tired. And by the end of it, I'm not in the best mood, you know, but if I have a break at like, I usually work out at six. So if I have a break at six, and then I start working. I start working again at at um, like seven thirty, seven thirty to ten, ten thirty. Um, that's another you know solid three hours with like high energy. You know, it's like I'm starting my day again. It's it's great. Um, so those are my little hacks. I wish I could do it in the morning, but I'm not a morning person, and I'm not a sports person, so I can't I can't mix the two. <laughs> so I have to work out in the evening when I'm already up and moving, and then I just incorporate it into my day. But it's also on my calendar. And if it's not on my calendar, I don't do it. It usually doesn't get done. I'm like, oh, I don't have the time. Someone was advising that with the workout, uh, to become a morning person, uh, it's all about just making it a habit. Like you should, you should yeah. get to the point where it's a lifestyle. Same way you wake up and. I wish I've tried. <laughs> I've tried. I'm not a coffee drinker. I don't know. Like it just has. I'm really slow in the morning. I'm just, but when I am up and up and ready like whatever if I have a really early meeting and I just have to be up for whatever reason then yeah. once I'm up and showered and had a cup of tea um then it's like the best time ever but to get me there is yeah I snooze the alarm like three times at least <laughs> uh, uh, yeah uh moving on to the current situation that we're in uh the, the pandemic uh it has really affected mostly how we work and work in general, and then businesses. Uh, you as a business person, you as someone who's working, uh, for example, now you're having this call at home. I don't know if it was because of the pandemic or you just couldn't go to office today. But how has this affected your work in particular, your work uh, and, and your businesses? Yeah, so yes, I am at home because of the pandemic. The foundation is actually working from home uh, all year. Um, and that has its challenges. I think I told you in the morning, I pray I have internet. <laughs> you know, sometimes it goes on, so, so I have a backup internet. Um, but the pandemic, okay, for me personally, I saw it as a blessing because that's how I tried to live life. You know, you just try to see the positive. And for me, I was like, okay, it's a time to reset. Like if you didn't get that lesson, I don't know what you're thinking for because it is a time to reset. It's time to just stop and think what's really important. Um, and for me, of course, family and friends and just nourishing and nurturing uh, the relationships was really important. But also just who do I want to be in the world? How do I want to move? How do I want to contribute? Um, I've done a lot, but what can I do more of? You know, if, if, if for whatever reason I'm still here after this pandemic, I must give, you know, I must take up room in this world and make it be of value, you know? So for me, it was a great time to reflect. Um, and that's how I ended up coming up with Big Sis in Business because I was like, okay, I have all of this knowledge um, that really came from hardship um, of trying to put these different things together um, that maybe I could share with other people so they don't have to go through the same hardship, right? And, um, I don't want to... I don't want to compete with what's on the market, but I think there is a gap in the market, right? For really young people. And Bix is not just for young people, but the target is around, I would say, you know, early 20s, like people just fresh graduates um, to maybe my age, right? Uh, Mid 30s. Um, just people trying to transition either from career to business or start business from scratch. Just how do you do it? And how do you do it in, 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 uh, in an emerging market like Rwanda? 
Um, so yeah, so I said, okay, let me start with like consultations, one-on-one -on -one consultations. And that's really, the idea came from, from the pandemic uh, when I was just sitting at home with my, with my family. Um, and we'd be like, so what do you think your purpose is? And what do you think your purpose is? Um, and then, you know, people kept saying, maybe I, your network, your network is your purpose, you know, not your purpose, but like your benefits uh, to, to talking to you would be your network, your experience in business, et cetera. And um, so I said, okay, let me let me put that out to the world. And it's been well received so far. It's only been, I think, like three weeks or or a month. Um, oh. and the number of signups. Yeah, it's very recent. Yeah, it's been very recent. Um, but because I think I have been doing it naturally, uh, without it being in a formal platform, you know, people are like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she does it anyway. But so it seems natural and it seems like it's been going on for a long time, but it's because I've been doing it naturally. Um, so that's, yeah. So, and then in terms of businesses, I mean, it was hard. We couldn't launch U Plus until, until this year um, because a lot of the contracts and stuff like that, like you have to negotiate and it just, it was just hard to do online, right? Um, there was a lot of things that we had to do in person. So with the lockdowns, um, but I think we we did eventually uh, launch in a lockdown in January. We, I think we were in the second lockdown officially. Um, but you know we had a, there was a lot leading up to that that had to that had to wait from the first lockdown to the second. So when they did open, uh, that was fine. Uh, in terms of funding, you know it's a bit hard. Everybody's been hit. So we have to self-fund um, a lot of people, a lot of organizations that we were counting on were like, oh, maybe not this year because we're refocusing our energy and our finances to COVID programs. And although you could certainly use U Plus uh, for COVID related uh, causes, it, it's not directly, it's not like we're not providing PPE services, for example, right? Um, so yeah, so it was hard in terms of financing it and launching it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have pushed through and um, it does mean that we're we're moving at a slower pace because resources are fewer um, but it's still definitely uh, you know making waves and growing so we're, we're very happy about that so and then for commerce for kasha i mean covid completely helped it <laughs> right because we used to we used to have to do trainings on e-commerce how to download an app um and now everybody uh, gets it. And, and so it was the best billboard. It was the best marketing tool um, in that sense, right? It really helped e-commerce uh, and adoption, uh, adoption rates. So, yeah. Well, that's nice. Uh, as, as an entrepreneurship coach and uh, someone who's also worked uh, for different organizations, uh, what would you advise new graduates who are about to join the job market? And also, maybe some who intend to come back, like uh, like maybe some that you mentioned how the rise and shine had an impact on people in the diaspora uh, coming back and creating opportunities. Uh, so what advice would you give to, like say people who are watching now, who either have a thought of coming back to work or set up their different businesses? Okay, I think from my own experience, what I would say is, from what I remember, because now undergrad is, is, is quite some time ago, uh, what I remember is just being so tired. Honestly, I was so tired. I would tell you to rest because that last year, <laughs> that last semester is exhausting. Except, right? except, except everything. Yeah, and then I can't imagine doing it, you know, in a pandemic where you still have to keep your grades up, you still you need to graduate on time. And then you have all of these other issues uh, that come with uh, being in a pandemic, whether it's, um, you know, mental wellness or mm -hmm. stress and all that. So I would say rest, honestly, rest, just take, take time, take story. It took you four years, if these are undergraduates, four years to get here, you're not going to die if you don't have a job in four days. You know what I mean? Stop and rest. Um, then I would say... When you finally do um, get a job, and in terms of applying, I think you should apply before, right? So start applying even as you're graduating, uh, right after graduation, start applying, but don't get wrapped up in the application, in the application process, right? I think you should 
rest, take a mini vacation. You don't have to actually travel. Nobody's really traveling. But to, like take yeah. a month off if you can or two months off, like, like, like the summer, right? The summer holidays that you usually do. Take that off and just like float. Hmm? Party, see family, friends, but also volunteer here. Um, somebody has a chiraka for you there. Do that. Float and see what interests you. Do you want to stay in America? If you're in America, do you want to move home immediately? Um, float for like two months. Just do nothing and just like do do nothing and do everything, right? Dilly dally. And then one, you know, but of course still apply. Um, when you do get a job, I would say be open-minded. Learn. Yes, you're all, you know, what is it called? Um, like really high GPAs, like you're all really smart people, young people uh, coming from great institutions. You have all of this education and you don't have experience, right? Maybe you've been working for a year or two, but people really don't count that um, when yeah. you come into the official workforce, not really. Even internships, everybody's like, oh, I have an internship here and I have an internship there. What we see as employers, because I am an employer as well with my businesses, is you are you might have some kind of experience, but it is not tailored to my business, right? And sometimes you don't have experience in Rwanda, right? So Different I would market. say learn. Just be ready, ready and willing to learn. Be open-minded. My journey, as I explained earlier, had its ups and downs and roundabouts. You know, I'm nowhere. If you had told me 10, 15 years ago that I would be working for an NGO, I would be doing anything with entrepreneurship, I would be like, what? That's absolutely, that has nothing to do with my future plans. And indeed, like let, let the market guide you. Let, um, just like go with the flow in a, in like a sensible manner. Like if you studied law, yes, try to work at a law firm, right? But you might end up working for MTN in the, the corporate law, the, you know, the corporate law office. Um, you might work yeah. for government. Uh, in RGB or Ministry of Justice or you know what I mean like just let it flow and be open to those opportunities um, because you just never know where life will take you and usually it takes you to really good opportunities if you're open to them right so yes try to have some structure but also learn and see what you're good at see what you like you might not like actually working in that field that you have studied right you might be like oh maybe i don't know i studied i don't know something that rwanda is not yet there right um i don't know think of like i don't know biomedical chemistry i don't know something something that maybe maybe it makes a lot of sense in america maybe rwanda it will take another 10 years so am i going to be a pioneer and help grow that or am i going to change course um so i think those are all things that you have to be ready and and just uh, open to um to understanding and receiving and yeah, just learn, learn. All, it's on the job training really is what you're stepping into. So be ready for that. Um, I think as young people, I don't know if this has changed, but when I started, I know there was, you know, you're working with people who are much older than you and uh, who have a lot of experience. So sometimes, especially in Rwanda, I think this is a Rwanda specific problem, which is a great problem to have, is that there sometimes there are lots of young people in positions of power, okay? Mm. And those young people are, are given those positions of power because maybe of the schools they come from, like Harvard, for example, or you know, any of the Ivy League schools, um, or the exposure that they have been uh, that they've been given in life. Mm -hmm. So those people have to learn how to manage the people that have been there before them and have been there for a long time. And that is something that people really don't talk about. It is so, so difficult um, to navigate leadership skills when there are people who think they deserve to be in your position and maybe rightfully so. Um, but you, you really have to navigate. Uh, I think people need to take some kind of coaching. Maybe I should add this to my coaching, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. You need to learn how to be a manager, right? Yeah. How to lead. It's like really how to be a manager, how to be. Everybody thinks, oh, that's not really something you can learn on the job. That is something you should take a course for. Because when you learn on the job, you're going to make so many mistakes. And these are these are 
people centered mistakes. That's the problem, right? It's not like, oh, I could just do a systems change, you know? Uh, these are people's careers that you're that you're that you're learning. You know, you're learning on the job about people's careers. It's it's really it's like a human resource um, course that needs to be had. And I think really young people uh, who are given the opportunity to lead do not have the skills to lead. And bless their hearts, they just don't know how. They've never seen it, right? They've never been in that position before. Um, uh, well, to, to jump in on that point. Uh, so would you say, there's a common question, would you say leaders are, are born or are they made? Am I born a leader or say, say I wake up tomorrow and I have to be, I've been put in some high role as a leader of, of a certain department or organization. Do you feel like I could pick up the skills uh, to later excel at that position? I think leaders are made to answer your question directly. Um, because I think given the opportunity, if you want to learn, you can rise to the occasion, right? You can always rise to the occasion, um, but you have to know your flaws. You have to know your weaknesses and be, be, be ready to rectify and course correct, right? Because, it, and I think that the assumption is some people are natural born leaders, right? And yeah. therefore, handle anything but that's not really then you're just throwing them to the wolves right without giving them any specific skill set um thinking that it's natural i don't think it's i don't think it's natural i think it's um office politics is real um ageism is real uh, both ways um so i think there's certain things especially in our context that you have to be very uh careful about and really take time to learn and understand and that will just help you you and your team excel Interesting. Uh, I think just reflecting what you said earlier in terms of what happens when you finish school, I remember in my experience, I was just so anxious because it was always that what now, that what yeah. now feeling. Like all our lives were just been told, you know, go to school, go to school, and then life will, life will happen. You get the job, you get the nice mm -hmm. house, the nice car, by the time you're, what, 20, 23, 24, 25? Uh, and I think it's cool. And then, you know, you're applying to places, <laughs> people aren't responding, you're doing interviews, nothing's happening. Uh, but yeah, it's crazy how life turned out. Uh, no, absolutely. And I think that that's why I said, don't get stuck on the application process because it really is so tedious and so discouraging in, in, in the beginning. I remember when I was, so I, I, did my, I did my undergrad in Toronto and I tried to get a job in Toronto first before moving home. And I applied, I swear, like maybe 10 different jobs a week. Um, I did that for like a year, one whole year. And then when I finally, finally decided to move to Rwanda, it was um, uh, during the world economic crisis. So of course things are not going to get better. <laughs> and I was like, man, forget this. I, I'd rather go home and struggle in my own country, and if that doesn't work, then I'll, I'll make my way another way. Um, I did. I never thought that that would be business, um, so I'm surprised by myself. Uh, but I do. I know. I know that feeling very well. Don't get discouraged. And sometimes, when something is not working, like when you keep pounding the pavement, you keep knocking the walls, and it's just not working. It means maybe it's not supposed to work. Maybe not. Maybe I wasn't supposed to be in Canada, you know. And had I not, you know, said I'm done. I've tried this for one year straight. I'm done. I'm yeah. moving. Had I not moved home at the time that I moved home, I probably would not have worked at RDB because RDB was starting that week. Oh, wow. Like, yeah, you have to believe in the timing of your life. Um, really, the timing of your life, it, it, everything is timing. Um, there's no such thing as luck. You know, Oprah always says, luck is opportunity and preparation. It's true. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's interesting. Uh, what would you say, I remember earlier on you mentioned having a, a mentor, uh, what would you say, maybe this is tapping into something she'll say to you, uh, but what would you say is the best piece of career advice that you have received or learned over the years? Um, Joanna did not say this to me. Uh, okay, I will tell you what she, what one of the things that she did tell me 
is, or I don't even think she said she said it, but she she um, she showed it to me in her daily work, um, and that's balance, right? She's a very 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 smart and hardworking uh, woman, and I was really honored to work with her for two years side by side. But when it came to family time, it was family time. She would leave the office at 5 p.m. sharp. Um, she would go for her kids' functions, you know, school functions. Um, you could call her at any time of day and night except dinner time because she that's family time. Um, so I think, you know, just learning balance and saying, okay, you can be, um, you know, a strong businesswoman, boss lady, and still have a functioning family that you love yeah. and that you want to be a part of, right? Um, so to see that was was really like change the screws of my head a little bit. Cause sometimes we, I think we can be so focused on one thing and then we forget other uh, important parts of our lives. Um, the other thing that a cousin of mine once told me and you know, I, I was telling him, I wanna do this, I wanna do that. And I was like, nobody, nobody understands that I wanna do everything. Everybody's like, start one thing at a time and then grow and then expand. And he was like, no, you know, have multiple streams of income. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was like, you get me, you know, multiple yeah. streams um is it um so especially Rwanda Rwanda is so expensive but so is the world so yeah multiple streams of income um and then you know you can use one stream to help build something else and, and uh then another stream to pay the bills and another stream to invest another stream to save um so multiple streams of income but other words of wisdom I think just like don't let people in your head you know don't if you have a vision for your life I don't know if you're spiritual or the people who are watching are spiritual, but I am spiritual. So I will tell you, I truly believe God gives us all, you know, whether it comes in a dream or a thought or whatever, like a, like a trailer, hmm? like a trailer, like a movie trailer, like a trailer. Say, this is what's possible. I'm giving you these ideas. I'm giving you this vision, but it's for you to implement and it's for you to believe in it. Um, and then what happens is that we try to tell our tribe, whether it's our parents, siblings, significant others, family, friends. And sometimes they don't always get it because God didn't give them that vision. God gave it to you. He didn't give, he didn't share it with the community, right? So even though they are a tribe and they love us and they mean well, um, sometimes our closest people, because they worry about us so much, can be the naysayers, right? They can be like, oh, I don't know if you should quit your job and start this TV show business. TV show in Africa, I don't know about that, right? Um, but I know. I don't really know how I'm going to do it, right? But I know that I should do it because it's the right thing to do. Um, and this is the vision that I've been given. Um, without it being like all hocus pocus, you know, it's, it's not. Uh, but I mean, like it's, like, it's something that you truly believe in. It's something that's like it's such a wild idea that like, where did this come from? This has to be, this is greater than me um is is something that i would that i would that i would say you know just trust the vision um don't listen to the naysayers um uh what else would i say yeah i think i think in terms of career if you want to have a job and not be an entrepreneur that's also fine <laughs> we need everybody everywhere um i would say always look for opportunities where you can grow so you know if you can see yourself there for five years can you do a new, a new kind of job every five years, every year, right? So whether it's, I started off as a project manager, can I move to operation, operation strategist? Can I move up to data scientist? Can I move up to, you know, whatever it is? Are there ranks? Can, can you grow in rank? And then also maybe can you grow um, in terms of, I like to travel. So if there's an opportunity, if it's like a regional company, um, can I be in Rwanda for one year and then another year I'm in Kenya, another year I'm in Senegal, um, you know, just even understand the continent and the different dynamics. Um, so room to grow is, is always uh, really important. Uh, you actually just reminded me of something with the, with the naysayers and how sometimes it's, it's actually the people close to us, family, and they actually don't mean harm, but yeah. they just maybe think, I remember this in particular, uh, Jay-Z was talking about uh, his uncle once telling him, like, you'll never sell it. Like, come on, you'll never sell a million, a million records. Yeah. And then he was like, 
I don't think he meant like how I'm just uh, eating in a negative way, but I think it was just like, come on, like let's let's try something realistic and exactly. let's look at him now. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, I agree. Yes, I think this brings us to the end. For the people tuned in, in case in case you have any questions or questions, uh, feel free to unmute and ask uh, Diane. Otherwise, I feel like this has been great. Uh, we shall share this with, with our network. Uh, take a couple of clips of this as well and share it on our, our social media channel. Uh, but yeah, thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alvin. Thanks a lot to the bridge. Um, very happy to be here. If there are no questions, that's fine. But uh, please send me the link as well and I'll share it on my different networks. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Sure thing. Uh, yeah, and in case in case you have any any need for some good candidates as well, I think we've we'll, we'll worked together before. But yeah, internships or jobs, feel free to to reach out. I will absolutely. And if you know if you know any young people that need big sis advice, holla. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you to have a good workout. Thank you. Yep, I have nine minutes. I gotta go. <laughs> All right, yes. Bye. Bye.